So let's begin by unpacking this story a little bit, shall we? It is still the early days of Jesus' ministry. We're just in chapter three of Mark. And yet, we heard a couple of weeks ago about how Jesus' healing ministry had, on the Sabbath had already annoyed people to the point of violence in their hearts and people were already plotting to overthrow him. So he has gained quite a bit of attention. And he goes to his home, but there is no rest or relaxation to be found. There's a crowd following him around and they are taxing on his time. Jesus has been healing people and my bet is he's exhausted. And the crowd seems to have taken over his home and Jesus' family can't even come inside for dinner. And the family thinks Jesus might be crazy and insane. They're not really sure what's going on or what to make of what's going on either. And just as his family walks over and kind of shoves their way inside to have an intervention, the religious authorities come knocking. And it's not just any religious authority. These guys come down from on high, from the head temple in Jerusalem, and they are here to come down powerfully on Jesus. He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. Beelzebul can be translated and interpreted in a variety of ways. And yes, you could say Beelzebub. Beelzebub. You could also say he's a demon or the head of demons. There's a lot of different ways to characterize this guy. None of which are flattering. And just so we know that 2,000 years ago, there wasn't quite as much cultural power of concepts such as hell and Satan and the devil. All of that comes actually in the meantime. But make no mistake, they're being nasty, one way or the next. They're nasty and it's degrading comments. And they are possibly suggesting that he is a pagan and full of poop. <laughs> because one way to translate Beelzebul is as a literal lord of the flies or lord of the dung heap. It's kind of fun. But they wouldn't say poop, they'd say something else. So. Jesus takes their insults and turns it around on them using a bunch of parables about a divided house that can't stand and robbing a strong man. And if we trust that these metaphors are true, we can conclude that since Jesus can cast out demons, he has successfully tied up the strong man or the head of demons and is clearing house or the world of demons. That is bold. It's a big godlike claim. And the religious scribes don't like this at all. They will be back. And in the meantime, we are brought back to the house and to the crowd, and Jesus seems to disown his own family of origin. And with all of this happening, and so many things to think about, it's really easy to miss the good news. And I think there's quite a bit of good news in this story, so I'm just gonna spend the rest of our time giving you some good news about this story. First, Jesus has real power in this passage. The crowds know and expect him to heal and to cast out spirits. And we learn that the religious establishment confirms his power, which is by when they say by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons, they're trying to point a finger at him but that's very different from saying he's a charlatan or he's a magician. If they thought Jesus was a joke, they wouldn't have made the trip. But they know he is powerful, and although they misunderstand the how and the why of it, they are taking him very seriously. Even today, we experience his words and his presence with power. For instance, how many of these words do we still have today? How many of these phrases are we still talking about just from this one passage? How many times have you heard, if a house divided against itself, that house will not stand, or some version of it? That's powerful. Whoever does the will of God is my family. Preach. Right? Right? 
These are powerful statements, and they are filled with strength and wisdom and truth, and they stand up. But wait, there's more good news. Jesus tells us no matter the translation that we use, and I looked at a bunch of translations. Thank you, Internet. Um, I looked at a bunch of translations just in case, and all of them, when talking at this one section, they keep talking about how God is merciful and forgives our sins. The whole blaspheming against the spirit piece is right after this, and we tend to look at that and forget the first part of that, that passage. And that gets us into a very different place. But just before this, Jesus' words are full of grace and assurance and forgiveness. And so in the NIV, which is not what we just heard, so I want you to hear it again differently. Truly, I tell you, Jesus says, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. Hey, all right. That's pretty good news. And if that is the only thing that you hear in this passage, it would be enough. All can be forgiven. And we also can remember the context in which Jesus is speaking on this blaspheme piece. I want to remind you that we believe that the Holy Spirit binds us together. And the religious leaders are trying to cast off God. Now they don't realize it. But this is the effect of what they are doing. They give the Son of God the name Beelzebul. They are cursing God, limiting the possibility that God could be at work in Jesus. And Jesus says God is doing a new thing, and none of us, none of you, religious leaders, has a right to shut that down. The religious leaders are trying to put limits on God. And sadly, they do not recognize God's work outside of their own hands, traditions, and assumptions. And Jesus defies them and the horse they rode in on, if you will. (laughs) And this is where I get nervous as a religious elite, right? Because it's easy to begin to assume that I or we know what God is up to and what God is not up to. And so I have to have compassion for these poor religious leaders who make the trek from Jerusalem because they couldn't see God and God's healing and actions even though Jesus is standing directly in front of them. They are not looking for God to do a new thing. They're not looking for the fruits of the Spirit to grow on vines that are not pruned the way that they have always been pruned. And in this way, The best definition for what is blaspheming against the spirit, because I know you're interested. So this is the best definition that I have found. To credit the devil with what God has done is blasphemy. Can we say it again? To credit the devil with what God has done is blasphemy. Now I hope that that soothes any uncertain hearts here this morning. Because I think it is probably not something that you or I need to concern ourselves with on the regular. For most people, I hope you might count this as a little bit more good news. (laughs) And if you find yourself wanting to check in about that, let me know and we'll get together and we'll talk through this blaspheming thing. And that leads us to our final bit of good news. And it involves where are we in this passage? So if we are not the religious establishment blaspheming God, crying crying demon, (laughs) or the family calling Jesus insane, we might find ourselves in the midst of the crowd. And ah, the crowd, full of broken people who don't necessarily understand, yet are drawn together by a common desire to seek God to seek healing, and to be part of something bigger. And Jesus' claim about his family being those who do the will of God was a harsh statement. The building block of his culture 2,000 years ago was family. Family was security and identity and safety and jobs and companionship. It was 
everything. And I, when I hear this passage with my 21st century ears, I can't help but hear his words of encouragement too. Not that he's shaming or trying to be mean to his biological family. Rather, I hear him expanding the definition of family to all who love and serve God. Now, that's not to say that I'm sure it was hurtful for his mother and his brother and his sisters to hear this. And I don't know that he was excluding them so much as he was opening the door wide to include a whole lot more people over for his family dinners. Chosen family, especially for those of us who are LGBTQIA+, or from families who were not safe places or life of, if we have a need for chosen family, chosen family can be life affirming and God sent. Chosen family for those of us who are thousands of miles away from relatives and for those of us who've spent, who've seen past traditional roles to love people and want to love them just like you would the family that you have. This is also life affirming and God sent. So let us give thanks for God's family that is vast and wide and ever present. For we know and claim the same power of Christ is present with us today when we come together and we do the will of God. We just heard it last week from Micah. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and you can say it, and love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This month, we are looking at our scriptures with a lens from Isaiah the here I am phrase, the response to God of here I am, send me. Today, here we are, Lord. Make us family. Make us kin, K-I-N, family. Knit us together that we might be kin to God and to one another and to anyone who was walking and doing God's, God's things, doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly. May we all be kin and live with kinship until the kingdom, not kingdom, not about reigning over, but about family creating. Kingdom of God finally reigns all over this planet. So may we be kin. May it be so. Amen.